Describe what you would find when you would go into a breakout room. It basically was every room would just have those black Zoom squares where students did not turn on their cameras and everybody would be muted. Maybe once in a while I would go in a room with a really eager student and they would be in the room basically by themselves. Um, maybe like one student might be unmuted or one student might have their camera on. Um, and I would kind of go in and be like, hey, what's up? And like, no one's talking. No one has their camera on. I don't know what to do. Um, so it was, it was pretty sad. This is High Tech High Unboxed. I'm Alec Patton. And that was the voice of Kat Wu, who teaches 7th grade math and science at High Tech Middle Media Arts. And if you're using Zoom for teaching right now, you're probably familiar with those black Zoom squares in breakout rooms. But just in case you don't know what I'm talking about, breakout rooms are a feature on Zoom. Here's how they work. Say you have a Zoom call with 25 people. You can split everyone up into groups of five, or whatever number, all in their own rooms. If you picture it like a classroom, it's like having everybody work with other people at their table if every table were completely isolated from the rest of the class. In my experience, adults tend to relax the moment they get into a breakout room because it's much more intimate and you can have a real conversation. Teenagers, not so much. I taught high school for five years and it's been my privilege to witness all kinds of teenage social awkwardness. But there was something unique about the discomfort of being in a virtual room with four silent teenagers with their cameras off. Just picture it. One brave kid says something like, okay, so I think we're supposed to be answering this question, and then trails off into silence, and their words just get swallowed by the void. And to be clear, I'm not trying to give students a hard time here. Most teenagers are highly attuned to social safety and danger, and trying to learn something new is always a little bit dangerous. Trying to grapple with something new in this strange little digital cave with a group of people they may never have met in person? Forget it. The safest option by a mile is to stay quiet and turn yourself invisible. Which, let's face it, is the one superpower you get on Zoom that you don't get in real life. So we're going to talk about what Kat and her team did to make breakout rooms feel a little safer. It's pro session time. Kat teaches a team of 56th 7th graders in two classes of 28. She sees both classes on Monday and Tuesday for 55 minutes each. Wednesday and Thursday, they have their humanities class and their maker class. And then Friday is totally asynchronous. Except they also meet twice a day, five days a week. We meet as a team in the morning to um, kick off our day every single day. And then we end the day together as well. Wait, all 58? Mm-hmm. That must be exciting. It's really fun, actually. <laughs> it took a little time, but um, now that the kids are really used to it, those times are honestly my favorite times of the day. The breakout room story starts in August when the school year started on the internet instead of in the building. And breakout rooms seemed like they would provide something that students needed. We knew that we wanted a space for kids to interact with each other more than in a whole class setting. Um, at that time, we were more just randomly putting kids in groups and basically crossing our fingers and hoping that they would unmute and maybe turn on their cameras and talk to each other about whatever topic, whether it's math or humanities or social, that we gave to them. It was a little bit of a just cross your fingers and pray. And describe what you would find when you would go into a breakout room. It basically was every room would just have those black Zoom squares where students did not turn on their cameras and everybody would be muted. Maybe once in a while, I would go in a room with a really eager student and they would be basically by themselves. Um, maybe like one student might be unmuted or one student might have their camera on. Um, and I would kind of go in and be like, hey, what's up? And like, no one's talking. No one has their camera on. I don't know what to do. So it was, it was pretty sad. And what did you make of that? It was very frustrating, but also I totally understood because Zoom is tough for everyone, you know, not just for kids. And they're being asked to be very vulnerable with people they don't know and talk about potentially topics that are scary, um, like math. And while it made me really sad, it also was very understandable. And we kind of knew, like as a team, we knew that this wasn't going to build community in our class. 
So we needed to do something about it. And so what did you do? Just talk to the students about what was going on and spent some time asking them about how they felt about the breakout rooms and what they hoped would happen in breakout rooms and what we could do as a community to make those spaces into what we hope. And so that was a series of discussions as a class and then serving the kids and getting their feedback about how they felt and what they wanted to change. Our main kind of game-changing survey that we had, we asked the kids, what went well in yesterday's breakout room? Um, What didn't go so well in yesterday's breakout room? Why is working in groups harder on Zoom than in real life? And what could we do as classmates, teammates, and students to make breakout rooms better for learning? Was that a Google form or what was that that you used? Yeah, that was a Google form after a discussion of like, why are we doing this? What did kids say? They talked about that it's hard when cameras are off and people are muted. You don't want to be the one person. It's hard to talk about math and explain your thinking or understand your classmates thinking if you're not looking at a paper together or you can't work together um, in a physical space. Um, Students talked about how awkward it was and how, for some reason, being part of a conversation on Zoom is just a lot more awkward than being in a conversation in real life. They talked about how it's easier to be distracted on Zoom than in real life and how it's also harder to get help from your peers and from adults when you're on Zoom. And do they have ideas? Yeah, they did. They came up with, it's funny because I think before before having this conversation with them, I think the first thing my team jumped to is, oh, we, we need to tell them to do X, Y, and Z. But of course, kids being the geniuses and amazing human beings that they are, they are able to come up with those things and more and better ideas. So they talked a lot about just talking more and um, not staying muted. And even if it's awkward, they had the idea of having a coach and having participation points. So that, that really encourages the group. One thing that they came up with, and I think that as a teacher, if I had come up with this and then demanded it from them, it wouldn't have worked, but they decided that part of their participation points should be cameras on. And so that made it So that was a request I could ask for them and they were okay with either doing it or not and knowing what kind of the expectation would be for doing it or not doing it. And one thing that they did say that I thought was really, really lovely was that they should introduce themselves to each other and maybe like have some conversations and get to know each other first um, before jumping into the academic work, which that, you know, made me and my team realize like, oh yeah, the students need an opportunity to know each other at least a little bit before we expect them to talk about difficult things together. And I think that was like a big eye opener for us. How did they get to know each other? How did you scaffold that? Yeah. So um, it kind of actually goes back to what I mentioned before of like, we get to see the kids twice a day in the morning and the afternoon, no matter what. Our afternoon time, we call it flex time, and we use that time for a lot of different things. We use it sometimes for project work. We might use it when we have a guest speaker. Um, Sometimes it's an instructional time. On Fridays, we do fun Fridays, and so we do like community building activities and games and opportunities for them to do more fun type things. And so we intentionally use some of those flex times for kids to get into those groups and do things in those groups that would encourage them getting to know each other. And did they come up with those in the Google form or did you have a discussion? Where did the, where did those ideas get generated? They came up with them. They wrote them down in the Google form. We had like a maybe a very short discussion about guiding them of what kind of ideas we were looking for and what we meant when um, these ideas should be to help 
you know, us learn to help us have a positive environment. But they came up with the ideas on Google Form, and we basically just consolidated their ideas and put similar ones together and presented it back to them and then had a class discussion about that. What came up in that class discussion? I think the biggest things were the students agreed that they felt this way. And I think that acknowledgement of, oh, I'm not the only one who feels this way, but my classmates feel this way too, and my teachers feel this way. It was an opportunity, I think, for us as a community to realize that a lot of us are going through some of the same feelings and thoughts. And I thought that the conversation in general was a very hopeful, positive conversation um, because not only was it, we all feel this way, but most of us want to make it better and we want it to be, we want this to be a community. We want to be a positive learning space. We want to change something in order to make this even a little bit more like regular school. So what did you do next? We made some changes. I think one of the biggest changes is that we made semi-permanent breakout rooms. And those breakout rooms are the same for every one of their classes. So the same group that they're in for math and science, they're in for humanities, they're in for makers. Um, The groups are four students each. And we spent some time giving them an opportunity to get to know those people in their breakout room better. And that group is lasting for a project. How long does a project last normally? The last big project that we've done, it's been about two months. And the next project that we are going to do is going to be about two months. So we're actually going to change those groups post Thanksgiving break. Um, But having those semi-permanent groups gave them that consistency of these are the few people um, that I'm going to see every day in every class and I can get to know them and be a little bit more comfortable with them. Within those groups, we picked a coach role and a participation tracker role. Um, The coach basically is somebody who encourages their group mates to speak up and um, to ask questions and make sure that everybody gets a chance to share their thinking. Um, And then the participation tracker just basically tracks who is participating and who's turning on their camera, who's sharing ideas, asking questions, and then reporting that back to the teachers. I think setting up those semi-permanent groups and then creating those roles were like the biggest thing. And I think with that conversation that we had, it really increased the amount of participation in their groups. And I think students started taking more risks. It's definitely not perfect, and there's definitely off days, um, especially, I think, like, Mondays are harder than Tuesdays, but the effort from the kids of, I'm going to try, even though it's weird and awkward, and, like, kids stepping up more to be the first person to unmute and talk in their group, those things definitely changed compared to before us making those changes. So when you go into a breakout room now, what do you typically see? I still see a variety of things. There are some groups that still struggle to um, get the conversation started. But I think compared to before, we have a lot of groups who are really positive and really productive. Um, There are some groups that still have their cameras off, but everyone's unmuted. And they're talking and discussing. We have some groups where everybody has their cameras on and they're talking and discussing. And one big change, I think, is like students sharing their screens and sharing their work in that way. That's something that I didn't really see at all before. But now I regularly will go into a room and there'll be a student who has their screen shared and they're sharing their thinking their work in that way. So that's awesome. Where did that come from? Um, That was actually a part of the ideas of making it better for everybody. One of the things that they came up with that was really hard for them is that it's hard to work on academic things together if you can't see what, especially in math, like you can't see the work that your classmate is doing or your group mate is doing. Um, And it's hard sometimes to imagine a student's thinking just from their explanation, but visually getting to see what they're doing is helpful. Um, And also that like when you're in a group 
and you're discussing something, it's helpful to make sure everyone is on the same page if you're looking at the same thing at the same time. So that that was a part of that discussion of what was difficult and in their ideas for making it better, students came up with that idea of sharing your screen as a way of bridging that gap. And what are you trying out for your next project? What what new stuff are you doing now? We're trying to give kids more voice and choice in what happens in their breakout rooms, who is in their breakout room, the roles of their breakout room. And I think we're also just notching up the expectation a little bit more, notching up like what it takes to get satisfactory participation points and things like that. We're just kind of upping the game a little bit. What does it take to get satisfactory participation points? So right now, the students in my class, they know that turning on their camera is like a way to get points. And then in a very short discussion, so like, let's say I give them only four to five minutes to talk about something. The goal right now is to talk once. Like one time, share your mathematical idea, share a question or something that you're confused about in five minutes. And what happens if they aren't getting their participation points? That's a good question. Participation points in my class is only 10% of their grade. It has very little impact of their actual cumulative grade. But I found that putting something in the grade book and them being able to see that and their families see that makes it a little bit more real for them. I think there are students who still do feel uncomfortable turning on their camera, and those tend to be more private conversations that we have with them of why they might feel that way. But turning on their camera is not a make or break. Um, I think that was one thing that we, as a teacher team, we wanted to make sure to honor because there's all sorts of legitimate reasons why you wouldn't turn on your camera and we wanted to honor that. And so while that is a small part of their participation grade, it's definitely not going to make or break their participation grade if they are participating in other ways. But there are students who we've had, you know, those conversations with just to encourage them. And there's other students who actually, um, because of agreements that we've made with them and their adults, their adult requires them to have their camera on. And so we, as their teacher, are supporting that. And We'll, you know, we'll give them reminders of like, hey, remember your adult said that you have to turn on your camera and just, you know, giving you a reminder. This is like a very technical question about Zoom. With these groups staying the same, is there a way to save those breakout groups or did you have to remake them every session? Apparently now there is a way to save those groups. But when we started this year, there was not a way to save those groups. So. What we did is we have the kids rename themselves when they come into the Zoom room and their name is their group number and then their class initial and then their name. So, for example, for me, it might be like 5M cat. And so once they all rename themselves as soon as they come into the Zoom room, That actually makes it really easy for a teacher to very quickly create breakout rooms just by going down the list. And we included that class initial because when we're in class with both of my classes together, we know which number goes with which class. That's cool. What other tips do you have about breakout rooms? One tip that I have is going really slow. These two months, it sounds like a long time for kids to be in a group together, especially since in person, I would have kids switching groups every two weeks. But that gradual release has taken quite a bit of time. And just supporting those students to be more comfortable in breakout rooms has taken time. And so I would just say go slow. And also the expectations for breakout rooms go slow. Even now, I don't keep kids in breakout rooms for more than a certain amount of time at a time because time can feel really long (laughs) when you're in a breakout room. Um, And then I made the mistake at the beginning of like, oh, they'll be fine, you know, 10 minutes in a breakout room and it it crashed and burned. 
So I, I think those expectations really having that gradual release and giving kids time to slowly get used to it. Breakout rooms also go more smoothly if they have a very specific question or task to do. More open-ended time has been harder. My kids, I think, are now working into more open-ended times, but starting with talk to your group about this very specific question. Do you agree or disagree with X, Y, and Z and why? And then sending them in there for maybe four minutes so each kid gets one minute to share. Is there a question you can think of recently that you had for breakout rooms that was really generative? Um, a really generative question. I mean, that worked. <laughs> um, I think maybe like a question of, I gave a student a math problem that you could get like the same answer using multiple strategies, giving them time to independently work on that. And then the specific question when you go in your breakout room is, share your strategy of how you solve that problem. And it's okay if your strategy is the same as somebody else's, still share your strategy. And that was like a good one, I think, for them to um, have exactly like know going into the breakout room exactly what they're going to talk about. And they had time to prepare and also make sure that when they go in there, they don't just say, oh, I have the same answer as Adam. And then that's it. So they would still have something to share. And how do you make sure of that? I think that's partly like the participation tracker. Like in, in that instance, you know, the participation tracker, I would give them the expectation of um, make sure that each person does this. And then when we come back, the participation tracker will always report back to me. Um, kind of like a little mini direct message in the chat of that. And then also me as the teacher jumping um, between the breakout rooms. I kind of speed jumped through breakout rooms in a way that is much quicker than in real life. I would never normally in real life just quickly jump from room to room to room to room, but I tend to do that more on Zoom. Do you remember a question or a task that you like thought was gonna work really well that totally tanked? Oh gosh, there's so many. <laughs> I think at the beginning, before, the, honestly, the kids have worked up to this more now, but at the beginning, giving kids a problem and just saying, like, go to your group and solve this problem together, that did not work at all. They, it would just be either one person solving the problem and just um, talking at their group, or it would just be silence. So that definitely um, was not productive. And so was the was the failure of that what led to the strategy of solve this yourself and then describe how you solved it? Yeah, I think that was one one of the changes. And then having that role, like that coach role, has been really helpful because when it's dead silent in there, the coaches have the power to take a speaking order or giving that like, okay, I'm going to speak first and then so and so you're going to speak next and giving kids that sort of, I guess power is the right word um, to make that kind of quick decision for their group has been helpful so that students are not just sitting in silence for the duration of the breakout room. Another change that I made was being a lot more direct about explaining what they need to do before going in which carries the load a little bit more than I would do in person. Um, I am a teacher who really, really think it's important for students to carry that load of thinking and um, problem solving. But I'm bend I found that in breakout rooms, giving them a little bit more than I would in person can go a long way to making them feel comfortable to um, try challenging things. Got it. Kat Wu, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to talk. Of course. Thank you so much. I uh, <laughs> hope that it was helpful and informative. For me, the big lesson of this conversation was that there is no question so compelling or protocol so robust that it will get a group of kids talking if they don't feel safe with each other. 
That means the problem of silent Zoom breakout rooms is a question of community building first and management strategies second. For Kat's team, the first step to build that community was asking students what the breakout rooms were like for them now and how they could make them better. So I hope you try out lots of the ideas from this episode, but remember that where the strategies come from is as important as the strategies themselves. Kat didn't come up with the idea of participation points, the students did. That makes a big difference. High Tech High Unboxed is written and edited by me, Alec Patton. Our theme music is by Brother Herschel, and the Pro Sessions theme is by Temple Dogs. If you've got other ideas for Zoom breakout rooms or other ideas for a Pro Session, send an email to unboxed at hightechhigh.org. Thanks for listening.